Precision with needling is important, as being off by a few millimeters can make all the difference between success and failure. In this obese gentleman with a BMI of 65, we scan and mark his midline and his spinous processes. However, there was a surgical delay, so he was allowed to lie back down and was later set up again for the spinal. Initial attempts using the original markings were unsuccessful because the skin was now in a slightly different position. We re-scanned as a rescue and determined the new position of the midline and interlaminar spaces. He also had narrow spaces which required quite a large degree of cranial angulation as well for entry. But what is important is that you can see that the difference between failure and success is minimal. So even if the location of the midline and interlaminar space has been marked accurately on the skin, the needle can still fail to enter the space for two main reasons. One is failure to advance the needle in a straight line, which is exacerbated by the tendency of the needle to deflect as it is advanced through tissue, or operator failure to keep it advancing in a straight line. Never let the needle bend as you insert it. Here, this operator is struggling to replace the stylet into his spinal needle, and the reason he is struggling is because the spinal needle is now curved or bent within the tissues. Controlled insertion without excessive force is the key to avoiding this problem. The second thing to be careful of is making excessively large changes in needle trajectory. Here, this change in trajectory angle is sufficient to walk the needle tip off the spinous process and into the interlaminar space. In the obese patient with thicker overlying tissues, this same change in trajectory angle results in a much larger displacement of the needle tip and contact with the upper spinous process rather than entry into the interlaminar space. Being precise and meticulous is therefore paramount in the obese patient and any redirections must be very small and controlled. In another video on the fundamentals of spinal anesthesia and lumbar puncture, I have emphasized the importance of controlling the overlying skin with two fingers of your non-dominant hand for palpation and fixation. Do not use your thumb to palpate as it serves little additional purpose. The two-finger palpation and fixation technique also applies if you are using a 20-gauge or 22-gauge spinal needle. With the patient in the lateral position, your hand is rotated, but the same two fingers are used to control the skin. In the video on fundamentals of spinal anesthesia and lumbar puncture, I also emphasize the importance of establishing where the midline is. If you are in the true midline, you will have placed your needle into the interspinous ligament. If you are off the midline, you will have placed your needle into the adjacent paraspinal muscle. Further progress will be impeded by the laminar or articular processes. Always use your local anesthetic infiltration needle as a seeker or finder needle. If you are in the midline, you will either contact bone or you will be unable to inject any fluid as your needle tip will be in the supraspinous or interspinous ligament. If you are off the midline, you will be in paraspinal muscle and you will be able to inject fluid. Make parallel shifts of the needle to locate the midline and don't hesitate to make a new skin puncture if necessary. An additional advantage of the two finger palpation technique is that it can be used to compress the tissues and in all but the very obese, the tip of the spinous process or the supraspinous ligament can be engaged with a one and a half inch or four centimeter infiltration needle. Many longer, small gauge spinal needles come with their own introducer. If this has a lure lock hub, take advantage of this to attach a syringe and seek the same resistance to fluid injection that comes with placing the needle into the interspinous ligament. When using a long 25 gauge or 27 gauge needle, be very meticulous about handling it to ensure that it advances in a straight line and does not bend or deflect. 
The needle should not be held at its hub, but rather along its shaft. A two-handed grip on the needle is not appropriate, as one hand always needs to control the introducer, which is responsible for directing the trajectory of the needle. The simplest method is to grasp the shaft close to its insertion point. I also nestle the hub of the needle within my palm to further stabilize it. The needle should be fed in slowly and incrementally as shown, paying careful attention to tactile feedback from the needle tip, which gives important clues about the type of tissue that you are passing through, skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, ligament, or ligamentum flavum. A 22 gauge or larger needle has the advantage of being stiffer, less likely to deflect, and thus easier to manipulate in small incremental redirections. Nevertheless, careful handling is still needed. Always use a quinky tip, not a pencil point, which takes too much force to advance, sacrificing control of the needle. Unlike a regular length needle, two hands are needed for needle stability, and therefore, I do not fix the skin with my other hand when inserting the needle. Rather, I ensure that the marks have been made with the skin in the neutral position and am then meticulous about inserting it without distorting or stretching the skin out of this position. Note too that I use the incremental feeding motion to advance the needle with my left hand, while my right hand supports the hub and keeps the needle in a straight line. This technique also gives me tactile feedback from the needle tip. When making redirections, always withdraw the needle into the loose superficial tissues before altering the trajectory. I use the index finger of my left hand not only to support the needle, but also to act as a fulcrum to make a controlled change in angle. To recap, use both hands to hold the needle and keep it straight at all times. Insert the needle in small incremental motions for maximum control and feel. If bone is contacted, withdraw the needle into the superficial tissues and make small adjustments in trajectory angle using the supporting hand as a fulcrum to control those changes in trajectory angle. A final few tips to end. When you strike bone, and you will strike bone at some point in some patients, use this to gather information and map the bony contours of the vertebra. Ask yourself, what bony surface is this? and confirm it by making a direction and see what happens. If you are on the spinous process, cranial angulation should take you progressively deeper. If you are off the midline and walking up the lamina, it will feel like you are striking bone at the same depth each time. If you are very far off the midline, you may strike the facet joint, which will elicit pain on that ipsilateral side. Although the skin and subcutaneous tissues of obese patients are often relatively firm, and less mobile than the thin elderly person, sometimes the overlying skin and tissues can be very mobile, even in the sitting position as seen here. This patient also has an unusual shelf of soft tissue. When scanning and marking the position of landmarks, therefore, one needs to be very careful that the tissues are in their natural position before marking it. And similarly, when inserting the needle, care must be taken to ensure the tissues are not moved out of their natural position. Finally, when inserting the needle, also be aware of the patient position relative to the horizontal plane. As can be seen here, this patient is leaning forward, and thus a perpendicular insertion actually involves directing the needle down towards the surface of the bed. Staying parallel to the surface of the bed would be a cranial angulation of the needle. The same applies in the lateral position. If the patient is leaning away from you, and sometimes this is actually an advantage because they are then more stable, 
then this must be taken into account when advancing the needle to keep it in the midline.